making history holding mass alone at the altar. As some pastors say they will defy authorities and open their church doors. The ruling overnight in Kansas that went all the way to the state Supreme Court. If you truly love your congregation, tell them to stay at home. The struggle over the celebrations. Heartbreaking milestone. The U.S. now has the most coronavirus deaths in the world. And while the curve may be flattening in New York, it is stabilizing at an horrific rate. Other parts of the country bracing for their spike. Why this man was pulled off a bus, the latest on the hot spots this morning. School shutdown, the confusion in America's largest school district. Mayor Bill de Blasio canceling classes, Governor Andrew Cuomo saying not so fast. Other districts watching closely what this could mean for students across the country. Hunger in America, lines stretching for miles as food banks are overwhelmed. With so many in need, why farmers say the crisis is forcing them to throw away their crops. We've probably destroyed about 4 million pounds of green beans, probably 5 million pounds of cabbage. Their plea to the government. In severe weather outbreak, large hail and damaging winds hitting the plains, the threat of strong tornadoes in the south. More than 100 million Americans expected to be impacted. Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. Good morning and happy Easter. Millions across the country celebrating the holidays while social distancing. Dan and I are here in the studio. Wit is at home. Good morning and happy Easter to you, Wit. Eva, Dan, good morning. Happy Easter to you both. I'm spending the holiday at home like so many others. And this is going to be an interesting experience for a lot of people from virtual church services to holiday concerts with global superstars. Coronavirus is dramatically changing the way we mark these moments. And we've got a lot to cover this morning. Indeed we do. Here we are in one of the most important days on the Christian calendar being observed under deeply suboptimal circumstances. Here are the latest numbers. In the U.S., more than 20,000 deaths and 32,000 recoveries. Here in the epicenter of the outbreak, New York City, we are seeing a flattening of the curve, although the death rate is plateauing at a rate the governor calls, quote, horrific. Now other states and regions are bracing for their coming surge. And confusion for New York City families as Mayor de Blasio announces his plans to shut public schools for the rest of the academic year inside his battle with Governor Cuomo and questions whether other districts across the country will follow suit. We have team coverage from New York to Washington. We begin this morning with Stephanie Ramos outside St. Patrick's Cathedral with more on the Easter celebrations around the world. Good morning to you, Stephanie. Eva, good morning. Usually this time of year, St. Patrick's Cathedral is is packed with worshipers, especially today on Easter. But the church is planning to live stream their services, and so are many other churches across the country. But in some states like Kansas and Michigan, some pastors are choosing to hold in-person services despite warnings from public health officials. This morning, Pope Francis celebrating Easter Sunday Mass in front of an empty St. Peter's Basilica. Easter is one of the holiest days of the year, but the COVID-19 pandemic is forcing some churches to close their doors. This traditional holiday prayer normally attracts thousands of Jewish worshipers to the Western Wall, now held with a small group of people. Here in the U.S., there is a fight over sitting in pews or watching a service online. In Kansas City, Kansas, the pastor of St. Luke's sending this letter to his congregation, writing, When we gathered on Ash Wednesday, we took time to remember that we will all die. This is not something we can avoid, whether it's COVID-19 or something else. We need to come to terms with our mortality. But the state Supreme Court deciding late Saturday night to uphold the governor's decision to limit religious services of 10 people or more as Kansas rapidly approaches its projected peak during the pandemic. And in Kentucky, the same exact ruling. This just one small window into what so many in the U.S. are grappling with. Officials and pastors openly defying CDC recommendations and planning to open their doors to hundreds, if not thousands, of worshipers today.
If, if you're trying to celebrate Easter at home, you don't have to be in a church. Don't stop doing what you want to do as a family. I think I, I practice safe measures and everything. I try not to live in fear. I've gone to church every day since, I um, mean, I never, I haven't missed a Sunday yet. In Jackson, Mississippi, Pastor Jesse Horton says his congregation will gather, but will also practice social distancing. My concern is why is it that everything else can be open? The pastor at this church in Arizona changed course, closing his doors after receiving backlash from the community, the church continuing service online. I want the community to know that I'm truly sorry to cause fear. With so many turning to faith, churches are turning to technology, like Rick Warren. And I said, if you truly love your congregation, tell them to stay at home. Stay at home on Easter. And that will curtail our assembly, but it won't curtail our time. Our, our celebration. And military chaplains are seeing an increased turnout as religious services have gone virtual. Guys, they have been there for me on deployments. I cannot stress enough how important chaplains are to the military community. And right now, they are trying to stay connected with service members, especially those deployed to states helping during this outbreak. Wit. Absolutely, especially during this difficult time. Stephanie Ramos for us. Thank you. Turning now to those striking figures, the U.S. now leading the world in deaths with the coronavirus claiming more than 20,000 American lives. ABC's Trevor Alt joins us now from Times Square with more. Trevor, good morning. Well, Wit, good morning. 20,000 plus Americans dead. The numbers are staggering and especially frightening because they're climbing so rapidly. Even with efforts across the country to try to slow the spread, the U.S. death toll has doubled in the past week with no signs of slowing down. This morning, a heartbreaking milestone for the United States, now with more COVID-19 deaths than any other country in the world. America's epicenter, New York, in the grips of the virus during another 24-hour stretch of nearly 800 people dead. That is not an all-time high, uh, and you can see that the number is somewhat uh, stabilizing, but it is stabilizing at an horrific rate. Hospitalizations and ICU admissions in New York are trending downward, a positive sign, but the hospitals themselves are still being pushed to the limit. These Air Force reservists from Washington State, part of a wave of reinforcements to New York City, medics mobilizing to the front lines. All those professions, all, uh, all the people were working together, we can uh, win this battle. Across the country, the virus putting essential workers especially at risk. In Michigan, at least four grocery store employees have died from COVID-19, all of them working at different Detroit area Kroger stores. The grocery chain saying it's taking additional safety measures as the outbreak takes hold. In Illinois, nearly 1,500 new cases a day for the past several days. Even with total cases approaching 20,000, Governor J.B. Pritzker saying they need more testing. There are concerns about testing in Florida, too. Reports of backlogs and some sites turning people away. Governor Ron DeSantis now pushing for a testing expansion. Even if you're not experiencing symptoms, but you've had close sustained contact with somebody who has recently tested positive for coronavirus, you can then come through um, and get tested as well. The pandemic putting many communities on edge. Dramatic moments in Philadelphia. A day after the transit system began ordering riders to wear face coverings, one man saying he was pulled off a bus because he wasn't wearing one. The transportation organization now reversing that policy. In California, police handing out $1,000 tickets to several people outside of Santa Cruz 7-Eleven, while Chicago's mayor, Lori Lightfoot, says she's taking matters into her own hands, driving around her city, telling crowds to break it up. That as more and more patients are thrilled to be heading home. Hey. 25-year-old Jennifer Martinez, who tested positive for COVID-19, was put into a medically induced coma and given a 50% chance of survival, now celebrated by the medical staff that saved her life. I'm happy I'm blessed to be alive. And well, I'm just trying to recover, even if it's slow. And we do want to let people know they should check their bank accounts this morning because some of the government checks from the stimulus bill have started to arrive. The Treasury Department says if you received your tax returns through direct deposit either last year or the year before, this money should be in your account no later than Wednesday.
Dan. And that money is so desperately needed by so many people. Trevor, thank you. We're going to turn now to the confusion in the largest school district in America. This weekend, the mayor of New York City said schools would stay closed for the remainder of the academic year, but then the government, governor stepped in. So what's happening here? ABC's Ariel Reshef is at home right here in New York City where so many parents are in limbo. Ariel, good morning to you. Hey, good morning to you, Dan. Well, states across the country may be looking to New York as a bellwether for what's to come in their districts as the remainder of the school year hangs in the balance for tens of millions of students across the nation. This morning, a public spat over the fate of the school year in New York City, underscoring a painful debate gripping districts from coast to coast. And have to very careful consideration. I announced today that the New York City public schools will remain closed for the remainder of this school year. As COVID-19 cases appear to be hitting a possible plateau at the epicenter of the crisis, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio with that stark announcement about the nation's largest school district. But New York Governor Andrew Cuomo quickly pushing back, saying only he has the legal authority to decide the fate of the city's 1.1 million students. There has been no decision. That's the mayor's opinion. Nationwide, already Pennsylvania, Indiana, Kansas, and Virginia among the states shuttering schools for the rest of the academic year. The biggest factor to consider when you're closing schools is childcare for working families. More than 54 million students across the country kept out of classrooms for weeks in the midst of the pandemic, marking a seismic shift to online learning. Depending on the wealth factor of a school district, you had districts where every student had a laptop. But at the other end of the spectrum, you have districts that have a high percentage of students in poverty uh, where they didn't have a laptop. Parents and guardians forced into full-time homeschooling. My youngest has dyslexia, and so reading for her is a challenge, and so I need to, I'm, I'm finding myself sitting down and doing the reading with her. A new normal putting pressure on families like the Urbanchik's as they try to find balance and a silver lining in the midst of the crisis. If anything that positive comes out of it, it'll be that I really will hone in on her uh, strengths and weaknesses, and I'll be able to ask for what she needs when she does go back. So many families left in limbo, and despite Governor Cuomo's pushback, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio has laid out a five-point plan he says will keep the public schools here up and running remotely until he hopes to open them again in September. Guys. All right, Ariel Rush for us. Thank you. Now to the scathing new report on the Trump administration's failure to respond to the coronavirus pandemic. The New York Times finding that the White House wasted vital time in the early days of the crisis that may have cost American lives. ABC's Rachel Scott is in D.C. with more. Good morning to you, Rachel. Eva, good morning. President Trump has said no one saw a pandemic like this coming, but the New York Times reports his top advisors and health officials did and that they tried to warn him. Overnight, President Trump touted his administration's handling of the coronavirus crisis, calling his response swift. We did it the right way. We, uh, we took care of social distancing and all of the things, words that nobody ever heard before. But a new report from the New York Times claims the president repeatedly brushed off early warning signs from the intelligence community, top advisors and health officials. According to the Times, Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar sounded the alarm about the possibility of a pandemic on a January 30th call with the president. But his concerns were dismissed. Weeks later, on February 21st, disaster response official Dr. Robert Cadlick held a meeting with the Coronavirus Task Force. The Times reports the group concluded they would soon need to move toward aggressive social distancing. But the president did not go forward with those measures for more than three weeks. Just last Monday, he insisted the virus hit the U.S. unexpectedly. This came out of nowhere. But ABC News has learned intelligence agencies were warning of a contagion sweeping through China back in November. And by early January, sources tell ABC that information was included in the president's daily intelligence brief. When did you first learn about the intelligence and could you have acted on it then? Well, I learned when I started, when I learned about the gravity of it was sometime just prior to closing the country to China. 
And the White House has responded to that New York Times report. The deputy press secretary says President Trump took bold action to protect Americans and unleash the full power of the federal government to curb the spread of the virus. The president is now weighing whether to reopen the country next month, calling it the biggest decision he has ever had to make. Dan? Hugely consequential decision. Rachel, thank you very much. For more on all of this, let's bring in ABC's Martha Raditz, who's also in D.C., where she'll be hosting this week later this morning. Martha, good morning. Uh, does the White House have a case when they argue that all of this criticizing is, is Monday morning quarterbacking with political overtones? After all, the president did, as we heard him say, shut down flights from China. He, he did shut down flights from China, but there were still Americans who had been visiting China coming into the U.S. I think, Dan, when you look at that New York Times report, when you look at ABC reporting, that everyone will go back and see what happened, see why more tests weren't available. Yes, there's an element of Monday, uh, Monday morning quarterbacking here, but it's important. It's important for the future. It's important to see what went wrong and what the administration did and if there were major mistakes made. So if this happens again, we can correct those mistakes. Indeed, because the likelihood of this happening again is high, given the fact that pandemics have happened throughout history. Uh, this week, you went to Baltimore to look at how this virus is hitting minority populations especially hard. This is one of the most cruel aspects of the pandemic. What did you learn there on the ground? Well, well, I, you, you know, you walk around that city and it's like any of the cities. It's like New York City. It's like Washington, D.C. It is just absolutely shut down. But in, in Baltimore in particular and in places all over America where there are large minority populations, they are uh, there are many more African-Americans, many more Latinos who are suffering from COVID-19. And we talked to some state representatives about that, a state delegate about that and what they're doing to try to help that minority community. This is a community that, that are in grocery stores, that, that some of them have pre-existing health conditions, and we talk a lot about that. Grocery stores, delivery, this is, you know, they're on the front lines here, and many of them are getting sick and dying. It really is, as I said before, one of the cruelest aspects of this pandemic. Martha Raditz, really appreciate it. And a reminder, yeah. Martha has a big show coming up this morning. She's going to have the latest on the Trump administration's response to coronavirus when she goes one-on-one -on -one with the FDA Commissioner Stephen Han, plus Maryland Governor Larry Hogan discusses his state's response to the crisis. That's all coming up on This Week Later this morning right here on ABC. And while I have you in this extraordinary era of news, you should go check out our new streaming service. It's called ABC News Live. Eva, over to you. Time now for the weather. Rob Marciano from Westchester County, New York this morning with more on a tornado outbreak. Good morning, Rob. Hey, good morning, guys. A powerful storm uh, shaping up. We already have several tornado watches that have been posted. This hail video coming in from Kansas yesterday, where now we have some flooding issues across parts of the Central Plains. There's that tornado watch just been extended east into Louisiana. We've got winter storm warnings and wind warnings, too. An expansive system. In Waco, Austin, you're in it this morning, and it all pushes off towards the east throughout the afternoon as the low takes shape and dives down into the Gulf of Mexico. Memphis, Little Rock, along that warm front, heavy rain, maybe some tornadic thunderstorms from New Orleans and through Montgomery. Montgomery, Birmingham, Nashville, Atlanta as well later on tonight and then through tomorrow morning. And uh, we're looking for the bullseye to be Louisiana, much of Mississippi, and into Alabama for strong tornadoes, possibly on the ground for a long period of time later on today. Not to want, don't want to diminish the threat for Monday as well. It pushes off towards the east, but damaging strong winds across the northern tier from Chicago to Detroit to New York City. We could see winds 50 plus miles per hour and tornadoes possible right through uh, Monday morning as well. Dynamic situation unfolding. We'll be tracking it. Time now for a look at your local forecast. Hello and happy Easter. Meteorologist Alex Leggett here. Temperatures today around 70 degrees, so another 10 degrees warmer today. We will have a chance for some added clouds, also a possibility for some stray showers. Best chance for rain will be late, mainly after sunset. Now, periods of rain will be likely overnight to early Monday. Monday, we are in weather alert. Some strong to severe storms possible between around 10 through around 2 in the afternoon. Highs otherwise around 80 degrees. Go back to the 50s Tuesday through Thursday. Okay, we're going to check back in with Rob coming up in our next half hour. We've been talking, of course, about celebrating uh, Easter in a pandemic, but there are so many other life milestones that people are having to figure out how to celebrate virtually. Janae is at home this morning with some great examples. Hey, Janae, good morning. 
Hey guys, good morning. Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of this, and this one is about a Philadelphia couple who are expecting a baby, Richard and Alyssa Lanahan. They wanted to do a gender reveal surrounded by loved ones, but of course that's difficult to do in this day and age at this point. So they found a way to get everyone together without breaking stay-at-home rules. So they rounded up friends and family on Zoom for a virtual gender reveal party. The Lanahan